This program is dedicated to those that paid for their lives at the hands of the state. Hello and welcome to another edition of Silent Voices. I am Dennis Lawrence. Beside me is Maria Malin. This is the only program here in America that you, the viewer, can express your concerns, tell your stories on the child welfare system. Maria, what do we have up today? Today we're going back a few years. We're going to talk about the program that actually aired originally in 2011. Leona McBerry was a woman whose child was raped by a neighbor. She did what she could and thought that contacting authorities and reporting this was the best thing to do, but it actually lost her her child. She was charged with failure to protect. When we come back, we'll be giving an update to the story and a short discussion. Let's join Dennis and my good friend, Dina Klustra, for, for this interview. Before we do that, let's go to Michigan for Parental Rights Wall of Shame. A Ruby man, 55, accused of sexually molesting young boys has pleaded guilty to 23 counts in 31st Circuit Court in Port Huron. During his plea hearing today, Daryl Zimmer entered guilty pleas on the following. Three counts, first degree criminal sexual conduct with a child under 13, 12 counts of third degree criminal sexual conduct with child 13 to 15 years old, and one count of second degree criminal sexual conduct with a child under 13. Two counts of fourth degree criminal sexual conduct, two counts of accosting a child for immoral purposes, one count of distributing obscene material to children, one count of child sexually abusive activity, and one count of furnishing alcohol to minors. Our deputies and detectives Beryl did an outstanding job of putting this case together, said Sheriff Tim Donilon. The prosecuting attorney's office then did a great job of ensuring Zimmer won't have the opportunity to victimize any more children. During the investigation, it was learned the assaults of Zimmer dated back to at least December of 2010. A parent contacted the sheriff's office in late May once she learned of the abusive activities going on at Zimmer's residence. Spectators who packed the courtroom Monday for Daryl Zimmer's sentencing applauded when Circuit Judge James Adair sent him to prison for what could be the rest of his life. Daryl Zimmer, you're on the Michigan for Parental Rights Wall of Shame. And that brings us to our guest today that I'd like to introduce from Port Huron. She has fostered 80 different uh, foster children, Leona McBurney. And I want to show some pictures of uh, Leona's children, uh, her child, uh, Anthony. And this story is about Mr. Zimmer had something to do in your case. Am I correct? Yes, he did. Now, you uh, have fostered 80 different children. So uh, tell me, how did you happen to adopt your son, Anthony? Um, I got Anthony back in September of 98 when he was 20 months old and um, he remained in my care. I adopted him. The final adoption went through and he was approximately four years of age. Okay, then, now, now you and your son, uh, over a few years, uh, got acquainted with uh, Daryl Zimmer. Uh, tell me, how did you go about meeting this person? 
Well, my son met Mr. Zimmer back in July of 2010 when his friend and their family invited him to uh, a campground slash farm to go camping with him for the 4th of July weekend. Um, I did not meet up or be introduced to Mr. Zimmer until December, um, I believe it was December 12th of 2010, when I was doing a um, Christmas benefit at a church on Range Road. And um, Mr. Zimmer had come in to pick up my son's friend and my son to go ice fishing at his farm. And um, his son's friend was there, introduced us, and told us Mr. Zimmer was a very nice man. The kids enjoyed it being out there, so I trusted him with my son because my son had been there before. So uh, he was an acquaintance of your son, and then, and then you, after a while you met him, and um, you thought he was uh, probably real, real good with children and stuff. Yes. And, um, you thought everything was going fine, you had a happy son, and you had a happy family, and then um, you ended up finding something out. What did you find out? Well, back in March of 2011, my son had invited me to come and stay at the farm in a camper that was there that Mr. Zimmer had purchased on the property so that, my, so that I could go out there to be with my son on the weekends. And uh, I was out there for 10 weekends, and um, it was like the last weekend out there. Um, I ended up leaving like on the following Tuesday, and um, Mr. Zimmer ended up which it would have been the 24th that I left the farm. And on the 25th was when I found out from my son's friends, the one that originally invited him to the campgrounds to begin with, had, um, his sister had told me what had been going on at the farm for like two years with Mr. Zimmer and the boys. And my response was not very nice, but um, I immediately was to take my son to the sheriff's department to report the crime. So your, your son was being raped by Mr. Zimmer along with, uh, I believe, eight or nine other Nine boys. other boys, yes. Nine other boys. And um, you immediately, this was re immediately reported to the police, right? Yes, I had went to a friend's home first because I had had friends that I took to the farm, their children, and I wanted to confirm to them that their children had not been touched by Mr. Zimmer and they were not. And the original phone call was made from their address but my son and I followed the sheriff's back to the sheriff's department to file the original complaint. Okay, well, the police, you know, they did their report, and um, did they cite you for any wrongdoing or? Uh... No, none whatsoever. They told me, my son and I, that we were free to go home, that we did no wrong. And they did a complete report and took all the information and then... Yeah, we were there from 9.30 in the uh... evening until after midnight. CPS got involved in this, and can you tell me a little bit about how they got involved in this? Well, the morning after all of this happened with the sheriff's department, I had left my son with my friends, and I had went to my son's school and had spoke with the assistant principal and informed her what had happened because my son was having behavior problems at school, and I wanted the school to be aware of why he was having behavior problems. And so with understanding what had happened to him, it, under, it explained his behaviors. And then when I had left the school, the school called CPS, and within six hours, my son was taken from me. Okay, now, uh, you went to the school to help your son because he had behavior problems. You just found out that he was molested. You reported it to the police. So I'm thinking you probably did everything all, all right. Did you, did you tell the school that you reported this to the police? Yes, I did. And they felt that they had to call CPS? Yes. And after CPS took them, I went straight to the sheriff's department and spoke with the deputy in charge of our case, and he said that they should not have taken my son. And I said, well, they did. He's like, they can't do that. I said, well, they already did it. What am I supposed to do? And I heard there was quite a story behind CPS taking your son, the way they went about doing it. Can, can you tell us about that? Um... They met us, they had my friends call me on the phone so that I would answer the phone. And then they said that the state was at the house checking the children and they wanted to make sure they were okay, the ones that were at the farm. And they wanted to see my son to verify that he was okay. So when they, they told us that they wanted to meet us somewhere, so we met at a party store parking lot. And when they got there, they told my son to sit in the car. And I'm like, well, that's not wise because you said you wanted to see him to make sure he's okay. And 
they're like, well, we need him in the car. And then after he got in the car, they said they were removing him from me for his own good, his own safety. And then they proceeded to tell me that he had to go through a second interview the following morning on Friday morning with CANS Council, which is a child abuse neglect services in St. Clair County, for a second interview, and that he'd be returned home Friday evening. And then I says, well, you need to tell him that so that he knows what's happening because of his mentality. You know, he's not going to understand why he's being taken. And so they went to the car and told him the same thing. And then when my sister arrived to take my son, they had told her the same thing. She said, so he's going to be going home tomorrow night. And their response was, well, it'll be Monday at the latest if we just need to get the interview. And within 22 hours, they had a rubber stamp paper from their office stating that they had orders from the court to remove my son from my care. Well, why did they have to take him in the first place uh, and then return him? I've never heard of that. Mm -hmm. Of course, yeah. uh, you know, the family court is a lot different than the criminal court. It, they deal in uh, family court on a preponderance of evidence, uh, which, which is a, you know, I think so. I think it's hearsay. They say it's the greater <laughs> weight, but this ex parte motion, when they got the when you got that paper, you never was represented when they went to the judge to uh, remove your child. You weren't represented, so it was an ex parte motion. Yes. And it was preponderance of evidence, and it was of the greater weight because you had no representation at all. Exactly. Uh -huh. Second. And they've done none of that. They never mm -hmm. showed any credentials was, or identifications when they took him either. Was that, do you it's know if that was stamped by a judge or was that rubber stamped? Uh, I believe it was rubber stamped by a referee. And we hear that all the time, the uh, Mary Ann Goldbuddle case, mm -hmm. that yeah. was rubber stamped too. Yeah, there was, no, there was no court seals on any papers I received until I went to court on the 31st of May and then I received a court sealed document and at that point they suspended all my contact with my son. Oh, wow. Now, what were some of their allegations that they had against you? Well, basically, they said that I failed to protect my son. That was exactly what they told me when they removed him. You failed to protect him. I said, well, if I'd known he was being raped by a 55-year-old man, I would have never been on that property. They said, well, we need to remove him for his own safety. And you went to that property, and they decided something about a, being a bunch of junk around or something? or. Um, he had a, a farm out there, a campground stuff, yeah. but he also did scrap things and there was like piles of scrap like metal that the kids would tear apart trucks or cars and break them down and do parts like that or he had different construction things that he was building over there. But there were certain areas that the kids were not allowed into and they knew those areas to stay away from. They pretty much stayed by the campgrounds, the campfire, and the campers. Right. Well, we'll flash some of those pictures of the campground on there, and, and I thought it looked pr pretty clean. So that was the, uh, they went for immediate termination, right? Yes. And they placed you on the registry? Yes, they did. And that's typical behavior. And um, how long was it before they placed you on the registry? When, the first by, the first, by the first of June, I received a letter that I was on the registry. So in about two weeks after the case was open, they uh, put you on this registry. They're going for failure to protect, I understand. Yes. And um, we've had a previous show on failure to protect. Uh, Kimberly up in um, Kalkaska. And there's uh, Faith Baden. She uh, got failure for, to protect uh, after she found out and reported it to the police that uncle was raping one of the boys. And in fact, uh, all three of her children were removed and one was murdered there in Midland mm -hmm. County by the adopted parents. I have a question. At any point in time, were you represented by an attorney? Um, when I went to my second hearing, I was. But at that point, they had already had the termination set and the prosecutor refused to drop termination charges, so we had to go for a jury trial. Okay, and you had a public defender? Yes, and who court did you appointed. Have? Who I, did you have? I have Sharon Parrish. Okay. And Sharon didn't happen to bring this up, the fact that you haven't been represented, and that 
Prior to that point, no, she did not. She didn't bring any and of that up? No. None of that. And at this point, I do have a second attorney that I have brought in at the case, so I'll have two attorneys when I go to court okay. for my jury. And as you said earlier that uh, you weren't charged with anything in the police report. No. That that came back clean on you. Right. So this is all family court business on a preponderance of evidence. Now, you do have a jury trial coming up. I believe in September, and by that time, this show will already air, but we'll uh, definitely keep people up to date on what happened on that. Okay. Now, you haven't seen your son since, I believe, May 26, you told me? Yeah, May 26 at 507 was exactly That was when they took... That's can they you took imagine them. how traumatized Anthony is? Well, just from hearsay, um, when he was originally taken, he went with my sister... And then from there, I'm not sure the exact time frame because um, I went into shock, but it was a few weeks, maybe a couple of weeks, that he was transitioned to a distant cousin's home on my father's side of the family. And that's where he's remained at. But I know that he has told my sister several times, why can't I talk to my mom? Why can't I see my mom? What did I do wrong? I told the truth. Why did they take me? Mm -hmm. And he does not understand why this is happening with him telling the truth because he didn't do anything wrong and neither did I. Well, that uh, sounds like this boy's being traumatized more by the state. He's been raped by a man, a 55-year-old man, and then taken from his mother when he told the truth. What does that tell a child? That it's not okay. It's not okay to tell the truth because you'll be taken away from the only safe place you know. Mm -hmm. And all I gotta say is more Corrigan is this protecting our most vulnerable citizens of the state of Michigan, our children? Our kids are our future. Innocent children. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else you want to add to your story? You had a few minutes left here. Um, just the fact that I hope and pray when I go into court that I can win this case, I know I'm going to be sitting before a jury of six people and they're going to decide the fate of my child and where he lives and I hope whoever those six people are that they really dig deep down in and search their hearts and don't just go on hearsay but go on the evidence and what's going to be there or not be there because we didn't do anything wrong. No, I got it. I, I have to ask you this. Uh, you know, you being a foster parent to 80 children and now going through what you're going through now, do you think that all those children that you have fostered have been abused and neglected? Absolutely not. Um, I know one child for a fact, and my sister was reminding me of that earlier, um, but I knew at the point when he was even brought into my home, they had said that he had slipped and fallen in the bathtub and broke his hip. And he was in a body cast, so he was removed from his mom for um, neglect and uh, for her not protecting him. And he remained in my home, and he, I think several months he remained in a body cast for this hip, and he was just a little guy. And uh, not even two weeks after having the cast off, my son Anthony, the one we're talking about, was running around the living room and just happened to have caught his toe on this kid's leg and it snapped his leg in half. They ended up finding out at Children's Hospital that the child had brittle bone disease. Had nothing to do with neglect mm -hmm. or abuse, but he was removed from his home anyways. Mm -hmm. And then at that point he was returned back home because they found out it wasn't anything mom had done. Now, now that you're on Central Registry, does that mean you can't um, do foster, you can't any more foster children? Um, and have I, they I don't do foster care anymore. I haven't okay. done it in about five years. Well, being on the central registry, you wouldn't be able to foster. You wouldn't be able to adopt. If you have grandkids, you wouldn't be able to mm -hmm. go to the uh, other school functions uh, mm -hmm. uh, as far as uh, being a room mother or going on a field trip. Yeah, uh, you can't work in any type of facilities with I, children. And I believe that's that goes over into coaching, too. And, and this registry... Uh, who put you on there? CPS. The CPS lady. What's, what's interesting about that is 10 years ago, because whenever somebody calls, you're automatically put on the registry. And my former spouse, he had like 40 people call and complain about me. 
So I was on there, and I was told all I, had, all I did was wrote a letter, and they took me off the registry. And I um, have worked for um, mental institutions and stuff like that with my degree, and so they've run my, you know, my credentials and stuff, and I'm not on the central registry. So all it took for me was just writing a letter. They took me off. They expunged my case. Now you have to actually go to court to get yourself. Well, it actually, can be. It can be. You can. You can write a letter to be expunged. Uh, the thing is, now it's a class one or class two offense. Now, failure to protect would be a class two offense, I believe. But a CPS worker put, puts you on there based on a preponderance of evidence. Oh, just a phone call. <laughs> and, and you're not even represented to, mm -hmm. to be on there. So this is something that we have to work on, something we have to go after because it's affecting too many people's lives. And CPS, mm -hmm. the caseworker, will come out and what they'll do is they'll write in their report their opinion on what they believe you think or you feel, even though that's not what you think, not what you feel, and you haven't even said that, well, they will just go ahead and say, you know, she feels this, this, and this when actually that's not even how you feel. And one part in there that I don't believe or that I put my own needs above my son's and I've never put myself above any of my children and also that I don't feel the seriousness of what has happened to my child. I don't feel that, you know, I did anything wrong. Well, how do they know so how you feel? They don't know how I feel. They've not walked in my shoes. They weren't out there. They didn't hear what I heard. They don't know what I know. And had I never went to this school and talked to the assistant principal, my son would still be home with me. And a part of me has thought many times, why didn't I just keep my mouth shut, go home and not tell anybody anything, not even the sheriff's department, and then my son and I would be fine. Well, this is the fourth but time. I had to do what was right I, get, I get a lot of stories here, and this is the fourth time that I've heard of this happening in the state of Michigan in the last two years, and I imagine it, it goes on a lot more than what I know. I imagine there's a lot more cases. You know, and I, I'll tell you uh, another thing that uh, I, I was looking at uh, somebody that, to tell you what workers do, I was looking at somebody that was adopt, trying to adopt their grandkids, and we were involved in this case, and we went through the place with the adopted worker. The adopted worker seen all the food in the freezer, seen all the food in the refrigerator, seen all the food in the cupboards. But in that refrigerator, there was one egg. And this adoption worker put in the report that she only had one egg in the refrigerator. So they didn't lie but they sure didn't, they tell, didn't tell the truth. The truth. Mm -hmm. And it sounds on paper like there was nothing in the food or the cupboards, just one egg in the refrigerator. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Oh. And mm -hmm. um, they have too much, pro too much power, too much mm -hmm. power, mm -hmm. and it's a very hard thing to fight in court. Right. Mm -hmm. I know my CPS report has 27 discrepancies in it. Mm -hmm. I want to give a little update uh, to the story since it aired in 2011. Um, uh, Leona Mary's son did come home when he was 17 years old. However, I have just learned recently that prior to his 18th birthday, the adopted parents have put out a PPO where Leona cannot contact any family members so as far as I know the son is right now back with the adopted parents although he's 18 years old and as in many cases uh, that we've seen over the years children come home they do come home after foster care or adoption failure to protect here in Michigan law states that they do not have to find the parent as being the one to administer the abuse. Thus, they hit you for failure to protect. This is not an isolated case. We have many cases across Michigan I've ran into over the last five years. Um, so, you, you know, really, Maria, I want to ask you this question. What does a person do in fear that they will lose their child if they report some type of action like this. What do you, what do, you do? Do you just let it go? 
Well, Dennis, one of the first things that I tell anybody who's getting into the, these types of situation is to know your rights. If you don't know your rights, you don't have any rights, they will, they will take their authority, talking about family court and sometimes child protective service workers, and they will abuse it for the simple fact that they can. Um, sometimes it's just they don't like a party in the case, so they will rule against a parent, and their findings will all be against this parent. That's one of the biggest things that we have to really let the people know is that you do have rights. And if, you, if you're not aware of what they are, research, 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 or contact somebody who knows. You don't always have to have an attorney in these situations as long as you know your rights. If not, they will walk all over you in both family court as well as um, the whichever court deals with divorces and abuse. I'd like to briefly uh, touch on the dramatization, the trauma that a child goes through, you know, being raped, you know, and, and we've had several children that have been raped either by a relative or a, a close friend to the family. The mother, the parent reports it and then this child not only being raped but loses his closest possession, his own family. Um, any thoughts on that, Maria? It's always traumatizing when a child not only deals with something like that, you know, some type of abuse, whether it's sexual, emotional, or physical, but you've also got the underlying factors that the parent that they're bonded with and the parent that is attempting, or grandparent in many cases, is trying to help this child through the abuse and help them reach a place where they can deal with this in a healthy manner, they're cut out of their lives and they're put with complete strangers. Now, in cases like this, you're dealing with multiple traumatizations on top of the other. And the child has to try to, try to figure out how to get through that without the people that have been in their lives all their lives the people they're bonded to, the people they love, um, are just ripped from their lives. And, you know, as far as the child, there's nothing they can do about it. And as far as the, you know, being a parent, protective parent or grandparent, again, there's nothing you can do about it either, except for pray for the child and hope that one day they realize you were not there, but it wasn't because you didn't want to be there. Thank you for watching the program today. You can catch us next week, same time, same channel. Until next week, my friends, remember, your voice can make the difference.